everyone. My name is Julia Rosenblatt. I work at the Deck Network, and currently you guys are in our community membership VIP event. Um, you know, I was practicing a whole speech to introduce um, Jasmine and John, and then I was like, okay, John has done so much, I don't think I could cover it in a quick 30 seconds, so I'll let him talk about everything that he's done. Uh, but we're so lucky to have John Henry here with us. He's co-CEO and co-founder of Loop, uh, which we're super excited because that launches on August 18th. So we are so grateful that he's able to come down here so close to that launch because we know he's like, super busy. Uh, but this event is being moderated by our amazing Jasmine Hillman, who is our outreach manager. Um, so we're super excited. And stay after. Uh, we have a community membership happy hour to just mix and mingle. We have drinks, Red Bulls here, Red Bull mocktails. Uh, snacks and all that fun stuff. So thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. Okay, so we'll jump right in. I hope y'all have been just enjoying Dallas Startup Week as much as I have. Uh, so John, what's up? Greetings. Good to be here. What's up, Dallas? We're so happy that you're live with us. We were virtual for the first event. We were indeed, and it was a blast. And I committed on the spot in that moment that we would do it in person, and here we are. So yeah, your promise. it's great to be here. So, you know, just jumping right in, tell us more about yourself. You know, what you do, uh, all the things you want us to know, serial entrepreneur, investor, all the things. Sure. So, yeah, happy to. Um, uh, and I, I like to just walk up on here with, uh, with a great amount of humility and respect for you all's time and that you all came to share a space with us today. Um, and so I'd like to uh, certainly engage and weave in and out of dialogue, but I also like to make the dialogue incredibly contextual to the room. I know some of you in here are working on your particular startup endeavors, others are in all all different various stages of your career paths and if we can shed some light and have some conversation here today in a way that makes sense for today August 4th 2021 then I'm game so with that um, I am the very proud son of immigrants from the Dominican Republic um, they came to the Big Apple uh, 91 or so and yeah I'm just a product of two big dreamers looking to make a whole lot happen with very little. Uh, and I grew up very much in the hood, uh, well below the poverty line, which, so there was six of us in a one bedroom apartment and we grew up well below the $30,000 threshold that makes a poverty line. That sounds so extreme now saying it, but in actuality, what a household filled with love. What an experience to be brought up in an environment that can be characterized as dangerous. However, it was one of the times that you feel most alive. You feel the love of the streets. You feel the sun beating down on you. You can, you can feel danger looming. And in a lot of ways, um, it makes very vivid to you the reality of life's choices. And it makes you palpably aware of the forks in the road that we're constantly presented, irrespective of the environment. It's just more illuminated when you're in something <clears throat> that intense. So um, I like to spend a little bit of time there in that formative DNA, because well before entrepreneur and businessman, I notice people typically start their s story with, oh, I went to school here. But your formal education is only but the sprinkles on top. By that point, you've already developed your formative DNA. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. And um, the long and short of it is, uh, I spent a little time in Florida, but when I came back, I came back to the city that made me New York City, and I knew I wanted to make something happen. And fortunately for me, I got a job as a doorman. And opening up doors for people opened up doors for me. For sure. Again, what can you make out of the circumstances that you're presented with? I was working as a doorman in a building where a lot of folks um, were doing interesting things. And I found that being very curious and inspired and wanting to get a lot of that situation eventually presented me uh, with one of the residents in the building whom I was telling Mendy, who I drove up here with. Uh, it's Mendy's birthday, by the way. It's our, our media birthday. director at Loop. Shout out to Mendy, spending his birthday with us. 
but yeah, I had a mentor, and I'll, and I'll cut it there so we can weave into dialogue. But I had a mentor. He wasn't even, he was a resident in the building, and, and Mendy asked me, hey, what about him stood out to you? And I told him I felt like he was slipping and sliding through the matrix. Like, here was a guy who made his own rules, his own system, his own code, and I just knew that I fell in love with this path that I later found out is called entrepreneurship. You can make your own rules, you can make your own system, you're gonna get punched in the mouth. But for me, I fell in love with a much harder path because it meant that I would live and die based on my own efforts. And that to me was comforting in a way. Awesome. So when you speak about just growing up in a household of love, I can imagine you had a lot of support when it came to pursuing your dreams. So <laughs> what, you know, where did your entrepreneurship journey begin and what motivated and fueled you? Yeah, um, it started... Um, <laughs> I mean, I was, <laughs> I think we all have uh, uh, early tendencies that flash to you a little bit of maybe what your disposition is going to be. Uh, when I was young, my mom was a custodian at, at a school district, and she would bring home the expired snacks, and I would take those expired Cheetos and sell them for half off and, uh, <laughs> and get that arbitrage from the cafeteria uh, at my elementary school. So, um, but it was nothing formative until working as a doorman, and um, that particular resident, his name is Hugo, that put me on, he had a franchise of dry cleaners. And I was working the overnight shift, and he was like, yo, what are you doing with your time? And, you know, I was Facebook, you know, hitting on girls, you know, I was 18 at the time. Um, and he taught me that you can activate time. Time can be idle if you so choose it to be, or you can activate it. And he began presenting me with projects and little, little things that, can, that I could build constructively with my time. And, uh, and so yeah, at some point, he extended to me access to his dry cleaning facility. So the actual facility where you clean your clothes is pretty expensive. There's a lot of machinery and equipment, what have you. He said, hey, I'll give you access but I ain't gonna hold your hand. You go out there and convince someone to give you their clothes. You bring them to me. I'll, cheat, I'll clean it for the cheap. You clean it for the market rate. So this beautiful dress that you have on would cost you $12 to be dry cleaned. If I could convince you to give it to me, I would give it to Hugo. He would charge me four bucks. I would charge you 12, I make eight bucks. Cool. Then take a, a, a bright math student to figure that's good math. Maybe not if you're doing a garment or two, but if you could do hundreds or thousands, figured that was all right. And so that's how I started my first uh, business, was literally taking my same cheap doorman suit, printed some business cards that said John Henry Cleaners, and I would d -d 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 knock on your door and say, hey, how you doing? My name is John Henry. Listen, boom, door closed. <laughs> all right, cool, no sweat. Try again and again and again, and eventually I got the jitters out. Um, and fast forward, I would end up through one of the residents in the building right before I got fired from that job he introduced me to the film and the television industry. And we ended up doing all the wardrobe for The Wolf of Wall Street, if you've ever seen that movie. Every single piece of clothing in that movie uh, was dry cleaned by yours truly. But most beautifully, my father growing up to get us through, uh, to, to put us through school and stuff, was a presser at a dry cleaner. And I was always embarrassed about it because my friend's parents had careers, but my, my parents had jobs. And how beautiful that when the Wolf of Wall Street came to me, all respect to my mentor, Hugo, I took the clothes to my father because I knew that he would do a damn good job. And after returning those garments to the Wolf of Wall Street, he said, hey, look, there's a new account in town. If you get them, you're going to be OK for a long time. That was Boardwalk Empire. After that, Law & Order, Person of Interest, White Collar, Made Spider-Man 2, Ninja Turtles, Spike Lee, Beyonce, Jay-Z. We did Broadway. We dominated the film and the TV industry um, as an 18-year-old kid, college dropout, no formal guidance, um, and I was off to the races. Wasn't easy. Sounds like a beautiful line that makes you inspired and say, wow, that young man did it. But it was hard. It was hard. I bled from my nose some days. I was so stressed I didn't know how I was going to make payroll. I had people's livelihoods that I was paying for all while trying to manage their own emotional 
uh, roller coaster that is being striking out on your own at such a young age coming from where we do. But thank God that I dug deep and developed a bravery to pursue a harder path because it was through navigating those difficult circumstances that I uh, was able to sell that business for a small sum and continue on now until the point where now I'm starting a venture that is on a you know, whole different end of the spectrum. Um, but it was only because of that very, very early beginnings. Awesome. So great work ethic, humility, confidence. So, you Thank know, you. on the road to entrepreneurship, we know it's a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. So what drove you on those really challenging days? Like when you just wanted to give up? Oh, man. My mama, you know, <laughs> just like, you know, I could do the most difficult things in the world times 10 and then some, and it would pale in comparison to the, the, the challenges that, you know, my parents went through. And I know I feel like likely many of us can relate here. Um, and that was a driving force. And over time, then it became about unlocking potential. If, you know, uh, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, the pinnacle of it, the self-actualized, must be what they can be. You have to be what you can be. So then the question is, well, what can you be? Uh, and so that push and pull of, at first it was dealing with the incredible pressure that is being the youngest of, you know, uh, the youngest in many ways. I was employing my older brothers. I was helping out, you know, mom and pops with the rent and stuff like that. So I had those pressures. So that's damn near, that's, a, that's more than enough to keep you motivated, I assure you. But at some point, now that I'm older and have had the chance to explore that emotionally and face it with intellectual honesty, I realized that it is a good motivating factor to be there for your family, but at some point, you must be rooted even in something deeper. And that has to be the pursuit of discovering what your potential can be. And I realize that this is a great understanding that I've developed, and this understanding does indeed come with a responsibility. I owe it to myself and to those around me, my team, eventually our customers, our partners, to be the absolute best version of ourselves that we can be. So I wear that, and I wear it with, again, great humility, but also um, not false humility, not like, oh, well, you know, not false modesty. Like, yes, I'm in this seat. I can take up this space now and say, I'm in this seat. I know I'm in this seat because I work to get in this seat. But you wear it with humility, but at the same time, you know, you know the responsibility that it comes with. Awesome. So that leads me to my next question about growth. How have you grown as a business leader over the last few years, and how has that contributed to the work you're doing now? Oh, man. I've grown a great deal as a business leader. It's a great question. Um, you know, my first business was really just hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. <laughs> you know, you just don't want to get caught with the hot potato uh, when, when the music stops. Um, you know, I was not formally educated in business, but I got my MBA on the road. I, I learned how to come up in business through negotiating leases, being ripped off here, uh, just going through so many learnings, um, at this point, I feel I have uh, a big enough body of work that I have sufficient depth of perspective in what it means to operate, at least in early stage business. I've not yet traversed beyond. That's where we're getting ready to go with Loop. Loop will IPO. I say to myself every day, we're going to ring that NASDAQ bell. And guess what? Every single employee at Loop from the call center to the C-suite owns equity in the business. I'm not thinking about next. I appreciate that question, but I'm thinking about right now. I'm thinking about 14 days from today, 818, when Loop drops. Uh, 
you know, I'm going to be asking for the attendee list and following up with you guys one by one and saying, hey, uh, is there any reason why you did or didn't sign up for Loop? And so, and how is the experience and so on? I am like intensely focused on the present moment. And um, hopefully it goes really well. You know, uh, that's I, I literally spend my nights like awake thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's all the time we have. I do have one thing to say. Um, I, and I think this speaks a lot about your work culture at Loop. I had a team member reach out to me late last night. And it's multiple albums that establish context. It's the reason that you care at all when Beyonce does anything. Because she has built context. And I believe that the music industry is the best industry in the world at creating fans. Deep emotional affinity. Sports too. You watch sports, oh man, you got traded, oh no, no way. You, we watch these players all throughout their journey. So then, why are we perplexed when we build an absolute stealth and then we pop up out of nowhere and say, I launched. Cool story, bro. I'd rather and it was very intentional. It was a risk, though. I will, I will name the risk. Greenwood is going to the same thing, by the way. You go out there and you build a wait list. And should you hit hurdles, cash constraints, regulatory constraints, product constraints, then eventually people cool off. But that risk, to me, was worth the reward of building context, hopefully, Someone in here gives a shit that we're launching in two weeks. Does, can you guys throw your hand up? Does anyone care that Loop is launching? Yes, sir. Look at that. Thank you guys so much. That means a lot to me for real, for real. And I've been singing. I've been like on IG Live every day. We're wearing, you know, like we're, we're ringing bells, y'all. And, and to me, that's part of your job as a CEO. You have to be the quintessential salesperson that not only shares the mission with the customer, but even when you're buying, you're selling. In real estate, when you're trying to buy a property, hey, I can buy this as fast as you want. Like, you, all the time, you're, building, you're bringing people into your orbit. And it is a wonderful skill for you to flex. And lastly, I will say that the absolute biggest shift in media that has occurred over the last decade is that used to be that stories were told in one piece of content. Beginning, middle, end, voila, campaign, Don Draper, Mad Men. But now you tell your story in micro bits of content over time. So it's been my gradual and consistent education of the market about what Loop is doing, let's say, that has established context for the room as a whole. And that is why we went with the waitlist approach. And by the way, one last little tactical nugget, you have to pay Facebook and or Instagram and or any of the platforms that are at scale anytime you want to reach someone. If you don't, fine, you can, you can not. If you can post organically and only 1% of your total audience will see it. Cool, right? Not, not great. If you want, you can pay to play and have them amplify your message to everyone in your organic audience, but you're still paying every time. But you know when you don't pay, when you build your own owned channels. When you can acquire information from, your, from someone that says, hey, I care enough about what you're doing. I want to know more. Now you have their cell phone, by the way. Cell phone number, SMS, I personally believe is the way of the future for one-to-one -one marketing, period. <laughs> Mandy's got me on the record. Let's roll this back in three years. <laughs> when SMS is the number one direct-to-consumer channel, and I'll be able to say that I called it, I believe that. So you can build your own channels because you don't have to pay every time you text or email your audience. Um, Clubhouse is another one that I think is a fantastic medium at the moment. But that's why we did it. I hope it helps, and I hope you deploy that method as well. Build context. Use iPhone videos in the dark. It don't matter. Use content is the currency through which you can communicate your message. Question, um, Lemonade is one of the companies in the business that I look up to quite a bit. I admire, I think that they are excellent in product. Um, I don't think that they're super marketing forward, 
but great products often don't require great marketing because the product drives their growth. Um, so I've watched Shai Winnegar and Dan Scheiber, and I think they're doing incredible things. That said, um, I think that our positioning in the market is that of a brand that is truly and deeply mission driven. And this sounds fluffy, and sometimes it is difficult to quantify the impact and the value of a brand, particularly on the fundraising trail, and especially with reinsurers. Dave Gallagher knows, like, try telling a reinsurer, oh, it's our brand is what makes us different. They're like, okay, guy, you know, they want to get down to the specifics of loss ratio performance and IBNR and all the quantitative metrics, and there's a place for that. But ultimately, if you're opting to be a direct to consumer business, at the end of the day, we're serving our customers, and I've surveyed the landscape carefully. I believe the following. I've looked through all of the ad libraries from all of the top 10 carriers that presently control 80% of the $256 billion market that is private passenger auto insurance. The entirety of the incumbents over indexed for pricing, 15%, 40%, 20, 15 minutes, 20. I saw a lot of numbers, but I didn't see a whole lot about people. So I felt like they're a mile wide, but they're an inch deep. And I couldn't help but to feel as I was speaking to my uh, seed investors when we were on the fundraising trail, that if we went a mile deep, but an inch wide, we would be able to win our community on value, on mission value proposition. And today our average cost per lead is $10.08, down from the average cost per lead that's $250. And I say, well, no wonder it's costing you that much. You keep beating them over the head with frequency on pricing, but no one cares about pricing alone. I believe that there's an entire zeitgeist shift of consumer demand today that believes that equity is not a nice to have. Equity and representation is a must have. And today we have 30,000 people on our wait list and 10,000 of you all in Texas that are ready to switch over to Loop. Um, and I think that that gives me comfort when players like Lemonade recently uh, announced Lemonade Car. And, they, and we will be going toe to toe, and I look forward to it. But I, ultimately, I believe that this is a large enough market that all you have to do is resonate deeply with your customer base. And we believe that our customer base is large enough to produce a uh, deck of corn, just like Lemonade. My last venture was a venture capital fund. Me and my partners as 20 something year olds raised a $40 million fund. I believe we're the only handful of kids of color under the age of 30 that has raised an institutionally backed fund. Our anchor was TPG, the biggest name in the world. I shook that man's hand from across the table, looked him in the, straight in the eye and said, I'm going for $40 million. And he said, and then, and then I remember I got nervous and said, or I would love your advice or whatever. And he looked at me and he said, advice is cheap, get the money. And it gives me chills to this day because he was letting me know that he got there because you got to build the bravery to go for the ask. So having been in those spaces, so, so you tell me, how do, I reckon, how do I calibrate or make sense of growing up in the hood hood and then shaking hands with Henry Kravitz and getting a five million dollar check from him? Like, how, how does this happen in, in a short time span? I don't know, but I do know that I can bridge both worlds. I can speak at institutional levels and we can talk on MOIC and IRR and I, you know, I can guarantee you that your cash on cash return will be, yeah, we, we can take it there, but I can also dap you up and say, yo, what's good? Hey, listen, what he's trying to say is, but what I've seen is that in 2020, in 2020 and 2021, we had a record wave of liquidity events, meaning mergers and acquisitions at top tier levels, companies going public, and guess what? 86% of those returns went to but a handful of firms, six firms, and all of those firms are based in the same zip code, literally, in the valley. But those companies serve millions of people. They have thousands of employees. And so I thought that the distribution of wealth, that, that allocation is, is being concentrated in but a handful of zip codes because they had the exposure to this particular asset class and knew and had the access to the deals early enough. 
These deals are not available to you. They're available to you at Robinhood IPO this week. They're doing real great, aren't they? But guess what? The early investors, employees, and VCs already got rich. <laughs> they IPO'd at a certain mark. They're, you know, your your uh, strike price on your share at Loop right now is 48 cents per share. When we go public, it'll be $38 per share. But here's what I didn't want to happen. I didn't want you to have access to this hot deal when we went public. I wanted to because I've seen it with my own eyes. Unless you have access at the earliest levels, you cannot generate wealth in a community that so sorely needs it. So we thought that we'd set an example and say the same communities that we endeavor to ensure, if you power our growth, then we should also power yours. And I am a diehard capitalist, but I believe in conscious capitalism. I do believe that you can do well and do good at the same time. Um, and so that is most representative of how I've grown as a business leader. At first, I'm in business to survive. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like Jay-Z says, there's much bigger issues in the world, I know, but first I gotta take care of the world, I know. You have to develop your own confidence as a person, first and foremost. And then that little win with the dry cleaner got me to see that I could do more and do more and do more. And now having a platform and the resources to potentially affect change for millions. And that's what we're going after. That's awesome. Uh, so I would love for you to tell the audience more about loop insurance, like exactly what it is, how it works, and just give them an idea of what's getting ready to launch on my team. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm proud of Loop. <laughs> uh, I'm proud of Loop. I feel that this is, uh, this is it. <clears throat> I feel like this maybe will be uh, my Apple. <laughs> we'll see. But all right, so here's the deal, right? <laughs> I'll start with the origin story. I mean, I have a co-founder and co-CEO uh, who's, who, she has her own way that she backed into this particular story of founding Loop. But one commonality that we share was summer of 2020, seeing the social unrest after the killing of George Floyd and realizing it hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, the, you know, these same things have happened for a long time. These systems will not passively change. They won't passively change. And for whatever reason, I grew up with an image of our heroes, they'll fix it. Puffy got it, Hove has it, you know, Robert Johnson's gonna do it. And then you realize that we have to endeavor to create the systems that we want to see changed. And so I was, you know, Carrie Ann at that time was developing technology and selling it into insurance and we discovered the fact that the majority of your pricing today in auto insurance is made up of things that have nothing to do with how you drive. Okay, interesting. We looked a layer deeper and we realized that credit score today makes up 65% of your, of your car insurance price. Okay, you, you discovered you look a layer deeper and you realize that it's purely demographic factors that have, before you set your hands on the wheel, have already put you in a box and predetermined your rate. Okay, interesting. And I'm just thinking critically through this. I knew it rubbed me the wrong way, but why? And it's because these are proxy measures. It's not ill intention. These were the data that were, uh, that were available when these systems were built. But to me, it felt like uh, we had the opportunity to, you know, in insurance is a colossal system. It's the underbelly, though. No one likes to think about it. You don't like to deal with your insurer. Like, it sits in the underbelly. But go and try and buy a property without insurance. Won't happen. Go try and finance a whip without insurance. Won't happen. Go try and make an investment without insurance. Also won't happen. 
God forbid there's a flood and you have, you know, you live as a renter in your, in your situation, you don't have renter insurance. It's the underbelly to everything. The greatest driver and creator of personal wealth in America was the FHA program, which was created in the 60s, which allows you to buy a home with 3.5% down. Well, a lot of folks know that the FHA program was not available to minority communities at the time, but it wasn't the banks. Banks were willing to lend. It's that insurance companies deemed certain zip codes, is now, it's now known as redlining, as uh, dangerous zip codes and therefore not worthy of insuring. And because of that, structurally omitted from the greatest driver of, of, of uh, primary uh, of personal wealth. And so I did more research and I realized that I love the fact that it's very unsexy business. I was in venture capital and tech. I wanted to pursue structural change. And when we decided to go after it, we knew it wouldn't be sufficient to be a cool little widget, a tech, uh, like a quoting engine, that then you know, gets you in the funnel and then sells you State Farm. <laughs> we needed to become vertically integrated and completely challenged from the ground up all that insurance is actually consists of, and we're starting in auto. And so what we've done is completely developed a novel rate filing, which means all the guts that go in insurance, we've removed things that we feel are completely irrelevant. We've removed credit. We've removed minor violations even, education, occupation, all these things that predetermine your price, we felt weren't relevant. And instead, we use a technology that can look at prior accidents that have occurred and even predict future ones. And rather than wait for you to get into an accident, we can let you know through our app and steer you away from dangerous roads. And your driving really should be the only determinant of your rate. This is what we believe. And we're launching in two weeks precisely to the day, August 18th. We've been working hard for a year. Shout out to Dave Gallagher who's in the back who got us our reinsurance placement. Um, so our mission is, to, is insurance built for everyone. And we're starting with auto but we will surely not end there. Um, so that's Loop. Uh, we, we're at four people at the beginning of the year. We're now at 22 people. We've raised three and a quarter million dollars. We've secured a $30 million reinsurance facility, and we will go for another $20 million of equity financing, and we will grow from 25 people to 100 people uh, this time next year. And yes, we are looking, we're hiring engineers, creatives, uh, illustrators, animators, designers, data scientists, actuaries, uh, uh, am I missing something, Dave? Underwriters, you let me know. We're on a journey to help to challenge systems, and we want to do it with people that, that are thinking big. Amazing. Um, hopefully, you can tell people how they can get signed up. Yeah, yeah, ridewithloop.com, y'all, please. Join. Yo, by the way, all right, so, yeah, but check, check it out. This one means a lot to me. Um, head over to ridewithloop.com, join the wait list. We're going live in two weeks. Um, uh, your support would mean a lot to us. Um, however, even if you're not insured by us, I did just want to illuminate um, the way that the existing models do indeed work in insurance and how those have downstream effects. For example, I'll give you a concrete example. Today, based on Progressive's actual rating, we have their actual rating engine that we use, someone whom is well-educated and living in an affluent zip code, but has two DUIs and a speeding ticket, gets a better rate than someone with a completely clean driving record, but lives in a lower income zip code, actually. Actually, is that not representative of the society that we live in? If you come from a fortunate background, you can screw up more, more frequently, be caught, and still have more of a break than someone who is trying and really needs a break, but the rates are stacked against them. So what we've discovered in insurance is that 
there are customers that get great rates, but their great rates are subsidized by folks that we believe structurally are placed and deemed as risky, when in reality, it's just a whole lot of bias that deems them as risky. We believe that we have the modern measures of data available to have the rate match the actual risk and democratize uh, insurance and make it work for everyone.